Hello, my name is David White and I am the co-manager of Technology Assisted Lifelong Learning here at the University of Oxford. Now this video is going to give you an overview of the Visitor and Residence Mapping Process, which is an activity that's designed to help you uh, explore and reflect on your engagement with the digital environment, predominantly the web. And then importantly, it goes on to explore how the people that you work with or the people that you provide services for engage with what you do. Now, throughout the video, I'm going to use the term students, um, but depending on your role and your context, you might want to swap that term for something like users or even staff. It doesn't have a huge bearing on how the overall process works. It's a three-stage process, so I'm going to start by mapping my own engagement with the digital environment. Then I'm going to go on to map how I feel my students engage with me, how and where, through these sort of digital places and spaces and different technologies. Then the third part, which I, I can't show you in this video, would be to gather together a small group of students and to go through the mapping process with them. So perhaps get them to map their own engagement and then move on to map how they engage with what you provide. Now, hopefully that would mean that uh, the second map there and the third map, the one that the students are producing, could produce some interesting results and you'll get a good idea of perhaps where you're missing each other, perhaps where expectations are being met or where they're not being met. And that should help, I hope, to inform how you evolve or change your practice, your approach, or even change the technologies that you choose to embed in what you're doing or to change the way that you use existing technologies because some of it comes down to pedagogy, uh, some of it comes down to your overall attitude rather than specifically the technology itself. Now this video is related to a higher education academy project called The Challenges of Residency, but the mapping process itself uh, comes from a JISC funded project which has been running for a couple of years now called Digital Visitors and Residents. Uh, and we've gathered a lot of data from both the US and the UK by interviewing um, people all through their educational career from late stage secondary school all the way up to faculty or staff. And we're working in partnership with OCLC in America on that and the University of North Carolina. So that's an international project. So that's kind of where this has come from. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a response to some of the things that we're finding on the ground that are very contemporary that students and staff are telling us about. Okay, so let's get started. So let's draw the visitors and residents continuum. Now I'm using a whiteboard here. Um, when we've run this mapping process face to face before, people have used all sorts of different things, little bits of their notebook, flip chart, pads, whiteboards like this, or they've done it digitally. And um, uh, often they've, they've sent what they've done to me, which is really useful for me to kind of refine the process. It's really useful for the Digital Visitor and Residence project as a whole. Um, so there's, there'll be information about how you can do that if you want to uh, nearby the video as well. So what we'll have is we'll have residents up this end, visitors down that end. Now I'm not going to go through the visitor and residence principle in detail because there's plenty of information about that elsewhere, um, but just quickly to say that these are not types of people and this is a continuum, these are not two boxes. So if I come to the web with a kind of visitor mindset, then I've probably already decided what I want to do. I go online, I find what I need, I do what I need to do, and then I log off, okay? So I really see the web as a series of tools or a pool of information, and I don't leave any trace behind, certainly no social trace. Whereas if I come to the web in a resident mode, then I'm going to uh, be living out a portion of my life online, okay? I'm going to see the web as a series of spaces, spaces or places where other people are. So I'm going to go online to express my opinion, uh, to uh, work through elements of my identity or my persona online. So as you can imagine, social media is where a lot of that takes place. So if I was wall posting to Facebook, if I was commenting on a blog post or if I was blogging myself, that would be more resident. It's much more visible and when I log off, I'm liable to leave some kind of a trace. So that's the continuum. Now what we can do with the continuum is we can add a vertical axis, okay? And in this case, I'm going to write personal 
and institutional. So that gives us a grid here that we can work with and we can plot how we engage with the web across these different quadrants. So um, for me, this is, this is a simplified version of, of, of my engagement, my personal engagement map. So we can start over here. If I put a block down here, then this is email for me, for example. So the reason that that's down there is because it's not a particularly visible activity um, I, I, I'm usually emailing a small number of people. I know who they are. I'm not really performing in the same way that I would be if I was posting to a wall in Facebook or if I was tweeting, for example. And it's very institutional. This is my institutional email I'm referring to. Now, when we've done the mapping process before, um, some people have actually got two blocks for email. They've got their institutional email and they've got their personal email that they probably put up in this quadrant somewhere over here. And it's, it's interesting to think about the fact that what you've got there is exactly the same technology, but split by role. So they've compartmentalized their institutional email and their personal email, which uh, many of us do. Now, having said that this is very uh, visitory email in, in, in my mode of using it, in actual fact, for, for many of the people that I work with here in the department, it's the place where I'm most resident. So perhaps you could argue that it should go this way a little bit but it's never going to be particularly visible. And you know there are other technologies where I'm probably um, institutional and a bit more resident, like Skype, for example, when I'm collaborating with people who are outside of the department. So let's go to the other end of the spectrum then. Uh, and the, the technology or the platform or the place, if you like, that I'm most resident in, that uh, you will, you know, if you, if you want to find me online, and this is the place to come looking for me, is Twitter. And that maps to around about here. Now, the, the actual size and the shape of these blocks and exactly where you put them aren't too important. Uh, in this case, my, my uh, Twitter profile, if you like, it started off being quite pr uh, personal when uh, I got the account, which was quite a few years ago now. And then as more people have followed me, so uh, members of staff in the department here, or people that I collaborate with around the UK and around the world, it's become increasingly more institutional and more professional in some ways. So it's a bit of a mix, um, but it's, it's gradually expanded down to be more institutional. But that is, is, is where I reside online the most. Now, another thing where I am really quite present, if you like, online as a, as a person, is in the blog, which is an institutional blog. So it's a group blog, uh, which is part of Technology Assisted Lifelong Learning. Different people contribute to it. So it's, it's not my own blog, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's institutional in that sense. And I only ever actually blog about things that are to do with education and technology. Uh, occasionally it gets slightly philosophical. Those are the longer posts and probably not the best posts, if I'm honest. Um, but it's very much about me, about my opinion. I'm putting the posts out there so people will comment, so that there'll be some form of discussion. So that's why I plot it down here as being really quite highly resident, even though perhaps blogs aren't the most social of social media. I still think that they can be very resident depending on how you go about things. So let's get the blue pen back again. Uh, talking of social media, actually, one of the intriguing things from the point of view of my map and from this mapping process overall is that my Facebook account would be up over here. And the reason for that is because I'm only really friends with my friends, um, interesting semantics there, and with my uh, family. But I don't really use Facebook actively. I just use it like a kind of fancy address book. And when we've run this mapping process before, we found people plot Facebook all over this quadrant in different places depending on how they use it. Because the technology itself, especially if it's something quite intricate like Facebook, doesn't mandate the mode of engagement. So in my case, I'm using it in a very visitor fashion. Some people will use it like an address book, but then also privately. So they'll IM, they'll instant message just one or two other people or message uh, a little bit like Facebook email each other. So they're not visible, even though they're being social in social media, which would put their Facebook somewhere around here. Whereas other people are posting pictures of themselves, pictures of their friends, posting all over the wall all the time. So they're highly resident in Facebook. 
Now my point is you can't just ask students what technologies they use because that won't necessarily be indicative of their mode of engagement, which is the more important factor if you're looking for ways to engage with them uh, in your practice or with the services that you provide. So, uh, what else have I got? I think that the last thing that I'm going to plot on here that is of interest goes right in the middle. And that, in my case, is Google Docs. So I only have one Google account. I don't have two Google accounts, and, um, or three or four, as some people seem to be able to manage. And what that means is that if you go to my Google Docs, some of those files, some of those documents are personal, and some of them are institutional. And so for me, Google Docs has converged in the center of this uh, map. Uh, for a lot of other people that have done the mapping process, it's Facebook that's converged. And I think that's quite interesting because what's happening is the technology is causing this, this context collapse, if you like. And what originally or traditionally would have been two separate compartments, the institutional and the personal, they'd have been uh, perhaps more neatly separated. Through the use of, because of the ubiquity of the web and certain services, they are beginning to collapse together and uh, end up in the middle of the map. So as I say, for a lot of people, it's Facebook where they've got a profile that they started socially and then perhaps students start to friend them, other staff members start to friend them or they start to friend them. And then you get to the point whereby when you log on to Facebook, you don't know whether you're going to be dealing with something that's to do with work or something that's personal or sometimes it's quite difficult to identify the line between those two things. It becomes very blurry. So we call that decompartmentalization. Now, the last thing that I'm going to put on the map, actually, which is something that's very easy to forget, I almost forgot it myself, but it's huge, it's so huge, we almost overlook it, is a massive block here for me, and for most people, which is searching. Now, it, 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 as I say, it's so common, sometimes we, we almost uh, pass it by. You could say that was Googling. For a lot of students, depending on, on uh, where they are in their educational career, this is going to Google, putting in a search term, and then taking a look at Wikipedia or one of the top three links, certainly something off the first page of search results. And I think this is typical, really. You know, this goes all the way across my personal and my institutional. I use it in both contexts. Uh, now, what we find out of the uh, JISC research is that a lot of students are a little bit nervous about perhaps talking about this activity, and they're certainly nervous about citing some of the non-traditional sources that they find as a result of this activity, especially Wikipedia. And that's because the institution that they're at, either directly or implicitly, has, has sort of um, said that it's not legitimate, it's not quite legitimate activity, it's not quite a legitimate sort of strategy for learning. And so what happens is because this is so convenient and so efficient, which is why everybody does it, they carry on doing it, but they don't talk about it. And this creates what I slightly emotively call uh, learning, the learning black market, um, whereby we have a massive amount of activity in this space, but it's not properly represented within an institutional context because students would rather keep quiet about it. And I think it's something that it would be useful to kind of open up, whether that's through conversation or uh, facilitating students in their sort of literacies in this area. I think this is a really important area. So there's a couple of interesting things that have come out of there in terms of decompartmentalization, in terms of the learning black market, and, it, and the, the, the sense that perhaps you can use the same technologies with different modes of engagement, and that's why this process is important. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to uh, map how students engage with what I do. Okay, so this was my personal map. Let's go and map how they engage with me or perhaps not with me, perhaps with what I do, but in, in some senses that uh, little linguistic um, teaser is exactly the heart of the matter. So I'm just gonna clear this off and start again. So let's redraw the quadrant here. 
And let's go crazy and get a different colored pen for this. So um, now my role here, I'm predominantly a researcher and I co-manage my group, but I do teach and I have taught quite a lot in the past. So my map here is, is really kind of an example of some of the things that you might end up putting on, on your map. Um, but predominantly, when I think of teaching, I think about talking to other researchers or talking to other teaching practitioners rather than directly with students. But I'm, I'm going to say students anyway. You'll, you'll see what I mean as, as, as I um, carry on with this. So perhaps the first thing to map is uh, the one that most people would think about first if they're talking about e-learning in that traditional sense would be the VLE. Now, for me, I've put this uh, as being strictly institutional, which is probably not a surprise, but it overlaps between a visitor mode and a resident mode. Again, the technology itself doesn't mandate a certain mode of engagement. And once we start getting to virtual learning environments, it's very much down to our pedagogy, uh, which changes those modes of engagement as much as the technology itself. So uh, if I'm just providing content and structure, then that would be uh, more of a visitor mode. My students would be coming to me and this virtual learning environment in more of a visitor mode. But let's say I've got discussion forums or I do the occasional synchronous chat, then that's more resident because I'm asking my students to be a bit more visible in their learning and in their practice. And that's a delicate business. You know, there are some students that will find that very useful, they'll find that uh, quite empowering almost, and there are other students that will be terrified by it, or might not even consider that to be what learning's all about. Um, they might actually have a kind of visitor philosophy towards education as a whole, and see uh, their education as being a kind of the library, a book, and discussions with an expert, and formal assessment. Okay. In the uh, Digital Visitor and Residence project, the GISC project, we find that um, students are all across the board, okay, and um, there's been some work done whereby even we, we discovered that even students within a single niche part of a single discipline have completely different approaches across the visitor and resident continuum. So, I mean, one of the things that comes out of that research is that you have to expect students to come to you with a range of preferred modes of engagement. Now, what you do with that, obviously, is very much up to you and will come down to what you think legitimate or credible learning or credible practice is. But the fact of the matter is that, that students do come with expectations that are right the way across from the visitor to the resident. So, if you say, hey, let's all rush into Facebook, then at least some of your students will be nervous of that. In the same way that if you said, OK, off you go to the library, I'll see you in three months' time, there will be a number of students that won't be happy with that either. And in some senses, the emergence of the web has given this massive choice for engagement, and it's quite difficult. I mean, that's the challenge, is how do we respond to that in our teaching practice or in the services that we provide and where we provide them. So that's the virtual learning environment. So what else might I put on that map? Well. Um, I think that one of the things that's interests me that I've been involved in in the past is a C MOOC, okay, so a connectivist MOOC. So these are the MOOCs that perhaps aren't in the uh, really high profile platforms like edX or Coursera, but they're the ones that are based on discussion. Um, all of the people that were involved, uh, all of the participants would be expected to have a blog. Uh, and comment on each other's blog posts. I'd have a blog, I'd comment on their posts. So you can see it's highly resident. You're, you're expressing your opinion. You're definitely online in a visible way as uh, you know, expressing your own opinions and developing your digital identity. And then maybe you'll come together for a big synchronous online meeting every so often to discuss a certain point. And so this is the connectivist MOOC, if you like, is up this end of the spectrum. And I think that that's quite an interesting area pedagogically, a very difficult thing to scale. Okay? And uh, resident activity perhaps is, is quite challenging to do on a massive scale. So if we, if we look at the other end of the spectrum there, uh, then perhaps somewhere over here, we'd expect to see an X MOOC which of these you know, tens of thousands of students register type uh, courses. 
And perhaps it's disingenuous to say that they're entirely visitor because, you know, if I'm the lead academic in something like that, then perhaps there are a number of videos of me giving lectures, of giving talks, not unlike this one, in that MOOC. So perhaps in some ways uh, that makes me a little bit more present. Perhaps that makes me a little bit more resident. But obviously I can't respond to students because that's a recording. Perhaps there's a real focus on the discussion forums, so I can drop in there, I can be resident in that sense, and the discussion in those forums, whilst inside the course, is still a little bit more visible, so perhaps this box here should straddle this line in the middle here. Again, it doesn't depend so much on the technology, it depends more on the pedagogy in that case. Um, now, uh, an interesting thing to consider is whether you go beyond the digital, or beyond. Maybe you're coming back from the digital. It depends how you think about it. Um, but what about the, the physical library? Obviously, that traditional conception of the library is only being books and physical journals, which are clearly libraries are an awful lot more than that and exist in the digital space. But the physical aspect of them, and quite often the way, again, this comes out, out of our research, quite often the way that students perceive the library is as that place with books on shelves, is very much institutional and very much visitor in terms of you have to visit it. And of course, um, you could map uh, the digital services of the library, and they could be anywhere depending on what you're doing. Um, so if it's just a, a, an online catalogue, then that's going to be somewhere down in this quadrant. But if you're trying to engage with your, your users, with students, uh, through social media, then perhaps you're travelling more towards this side of the grid. So again, on pedagogy, let's say that um, I was running a course that involved my students blogging. I'd put this here uh, if, if I was expecting them to actually, you know, as an extension of the kind of pedagogy that you get in these connectivist MOOCs, if I was expecting them to blog as part of their practice, if I was expecting them to make videos, uh, for example, and post them openly on YouTube, then I think that that is highly resident and you could argue that it's, it's quite difficult to do that without putting some of yourself into it, um, some of, uh, and it becomes increasingly more personal. So your practice gradually evolves to include who you are, as well as just that abstract idea of content and of perhaps those traditional forms like writing essays where you're trying to sort of extract that individual voice. Some of these methods that you ha have the opportunity to do because of the web are very much putting the individual back in, and again, some people find that really uh, nerve-wracking. And then the last thing that I'm going to put on this map would be right in the middle, and it's getting a bit scrappy now, and I've rubbed half of it out with my wrist, would be Facebook groups. The kind of thing that you might set up for your course, but probably more likely, and this again comes from uh, the data from our GIST project, it's much more likely that students will be setting them up for themselves. And the reason that they end up in the middle there um, is because, you know, there's that big debate, you know, do, do I try and friend my students in Facebook? What happens if they try and friend me? Should I be a member of their groups that are discussing the course or not? And that very much comes down to the nature of your practice, perhaps the nature of your discipline uh, and the work that your students are being tasked with. Uh, and also the, 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 you know, what your students are, are, are comfortable with. And I think that's interesting to explore. But again, that's an area where we see this decompartmentalization and, it's, and it can be quite a tricky area to negotiate. Now, one of the things that's worth saying about um, a map in terms of students engaging with what you're providing, as I've said uh, with the previous map, we can't necessarily just go by the technology sort of indicating how people are, how students are engaging. The, our pedagogy is going to have a massive bearing on this. So you know, here it becomes a little bit more sophisticated and we're not just being technologically led here. Obviously the mapping process, we're mapping technologies, but where they go is based on other things. I think that something that we've been uh, tripped up by or, or almost um, conned by in the past is that a lot of activity in this area, so if a student has a lot of activity here when they map themselves, doesn't necessarily mean that they'll easily be able to translate that down to here. So personal residency uh, within your peer group, within your social group, 
doesn't necessarily translate over that. Those literacies, those skills that are involved, don't necessarily slide down into the institutional very smoothly. And actually, the process of encouraging students to um, translate their practice from this quadrant down towards this quadrant is a highly delicate one. And you need to have some sort of gentle transition points. So we can't necessarily expect students who are all over Facebook to suddenly want to be visibly blogging within their cohort about areas to do with their discipline, about, about their learning, because it's, it's highly risky. And it takes years to become uh, comfortable with that, to develop your own voice as a member of your field, if you like. But I think that that's something that higher education should be doing, is, is um, uh, helping students through that kind of journey of developing their voice, of being able to express an opinion, of putting together a cogent argument, which traditionally in higher education would have been done uh, through the exam, through the essay, between perhaps you and your um, tutor as a student, or perhaps in, in really safe closed spaces like tutorials or seminars. But the web gives us an opportunity to do this on a bigger scale. But just going from, but, but just saying, okay, they're all over YouTube, they're all over Facebook, so we'll start them blogging because they're obviously comfortable with being out there online. Is, that just doesn't work because it's a very risky business, especially when you're early in your educational career, to express yourself about particular topics that are to do with your learning, especially amongst your, your sort of student peer group, if you like. And there are steps that can be taken to gradually, if you like, um, onion skin from being completely closed and private in the way that you engage with the course or completely visitor to gradually moving outwards until you're expressing yourself fairly openly online and beginning to feel the benefit from that, beginning to see what the benefit is in terms of developing your practice and developing your understanding. And the Higher Education Academy project that I mentioned at the start is called the challenges of residency, not because uh, visitor mode is not as good as a resident mode, in actual fact, given the nature of our pedagogy predominantly in higher education at the moment, a visitor mode will be most successful and most efficient within your course. There's a question as to how well that will serve you beyond your course. Um, so it's not because one's better than the other. It's called the challenges of residency because the resonant area is, is the side of things that we know the least about. It's, it's new, essentially. And I don't mean new as in a new shiny gadget, let's follow the technology in that way. I mean, it's new in terms of the opportunities we have to evolve our practice and um, broaden the ways that we can engage our students and the ways that they can engage with us, of course. So um, the third part of the process, as I mentioned, would be to get together a, a small number of students and ask them to go through the mapping process themselves, pretty much the same as what we've done here. You could start by asking them to map their own personal engagement, to tune them into the process, and then you could move on to ask them to map how they engage with what you provide, with the services you provide, and hopefully comparing uh, your version of this map that I've just done and the version of the maps that they do, you'll be able to see where expectations meet and where they don't meet. Now, what's important here is not necessarily exactly where the technologies map, but the discussions that come from that. So I think what's really useful about this mapping exercise is the way that it brings discussion to the fore about the underlying attitudes and the underlying expectations behind things that are actually what, dri what drives the way that they engage with technology. And what I tend to find is that fairly quickly you move from talking about, well, where's Facebook going to go on here? Where am I going to put email? You move from that to talking about well, this is what actually I think I'm trying to achieve with my teaching. This is what I think students should be learning, and this is why I think it's important. So it very quickly stops becoming predominantly about technology and moves beyond that. But it's exactly that kind of discussion that can help you to um, put a strategy in place for the future, whether that's just changing the way or evolving the way that you engage with the students, the way that you teach, where you choose to reside online, where you choose to not reside online, or whether it's how you choose to spend your budget on which bits of technology and how you choose to promote those pieces of technology. But it will be relative to how the students learn and their expectations.
But certainly one of the important things in this is whether you decide that you ought to be promoting these resonant forms of engagement, whether you think that that's an institutional responsibility. So a lot of institutions have graduate attributes that actually hint at this idea of residency, even though they don't talk about it explicitly. Um, or whether you think that this is something that's the student's business and it should be outside of the institution. Now the web makes the edges of institutions very blurry, okay? And it also gives people that are perhaps in an institutional context or in an institutional role to kind of all go round the institution, which sounds ne negative, to actually dis... It, what happens is the web disintermediates the institution. So, for example, I can set up a Twitter account, which is my Twitter account. I own it, but I spend most of my time talking about work in it. I can I can have uh, I could set up my own blog if I wanted to, and in that blog I would say my name is David White and I currently work for the University of Oxford. I'm going to discuss things that are to do with education, learning, and technology. Okay, and we see that as as the individual as the institution. Okay, so we can see this shift whereby the hub, in the resident side of things, is moving away from the traditional core, the hierarchical institution, if you like, and more towards the individual. So the web gives everybody the opportunity to have a voice without having any mediators or gatekeepers. And I think that that's having a very interesting effect on how students learn, uh, especially in terms of their information seeking behavior, but it's also having an interesting effect on research and academic practice and the opportunities there. So that's the visitor and residence mapping process, and I hope that you get valuable information out of that, useful information that you can respond to. And if you need any uh, clarification, you want to ask me any other questions about the process, then please um, contact me. I'm very, very happy to talk about this. And if you generate any really intriguing maps and you've got the clearance to share those, then uh, I'd be very interested to see those too. Uh, there's plenty of information uh, around uh, this process, around visitor and residents in general. You can follow those links as well.